poetry in a time of protests, and the power of prose, with Lebanese poet Jessica Saman, for this episode of the Beirut Banyan. The reason why we're calling it the Thawra because this one is a revolution. And historically, revolutions are there to throw the system off. Um, versus like protests, could be, one could be protesting against a certain specific law, um, a certain, like, like a crisis. Uh, in this case, is this is a revolution against the system, a system that we've had since the Civil War. This feels like the end of the Civil War. What do you mean by that? Meaning that it's 1989 ended this these last three weeks? Mm -hmm. I would say that in the last three weeks, the Civil War ended in our psyche or in our consciousness. Can you elaborate on that, though? Yeah. Because I like to make the comparison that three decades ago, and mm -hmm. I, believe, I believe it's this week, the Berlin Wall fell. So 30 years ago, that unique moment happened, and it was a celebration, and Germany is very different today than it was 30 years ago. Beirut doesn't feel different. Beirut feels like it's stuck in time. Is that what you're describing? We're almost locked in the 1989 moment? Right. We're locked in the 1989 mentality. And, and one thing to look at is that we never really mourned or processed the civil war collectively. Mm -hmm. We don't have a civil war museum. We don't have... Uh, we, we didn't have any restorative, restorative justice. The people who were the, the, you know, the warlords in the Civil War were not put on trial, yeah. right? So there was never any correction. Mm -hmm. And what happened is we, I mean, I will, I'm going to speak from a psychological perspective. I would say we've been living in a PTSD form of trauma yeah. uh, and the way we've been numbing is through um, trying to have a good time mm -hmm. uh, also to disassociate mm -hmm. and what's beautiful about what happened right now is there has been a collective awakening and you know th the thing is like that we can't get rid of the trauma but what we, what we could do is we can choose to digest it yeah. right yeah. And, it would, and in order to digest it we have to feel and I, we have to feel the pain of it. And do you think now we're feeling a collective pain that we didn't necessarily feel, whether it was 2015 or even before, that we're all suffering together this time around? I would say right now, uh, like, everyone caught up to it. Mm. At, at some point, the people who had more privilege, mm. they were able to feel the pain because they well, had privilege. Well, that's interesting. Caught up, meaning that the, the richer got poorer and they're now feeling the pain of the poor? Is that what I understood? I would say that it's more that the... the before it was a privilege for one to realize that they're in pain to go protest. I see. Okay. But right now we got to a point where even the people who don't have privilege are risking everything and going and protesting. Right. And I would say that is the big um, that that's changing the paradigm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I've noticed that usually there's a hesitation where you have parents telling their children, "Don't go protest. It's dangerous." This time around, it almost feels like it's your duty. Right. Whether you're the mom or the grandmother or the daughter, right. doesn't matter. Everyone should be on the street. It's intergenerational. Yeah. It's yeah. intergenerational. It's intersectarian. It's interclass. Yeah. It's it's just it's a, it it still feels surreal. Yeah. And you've been protesting, I'm guessing, since you arrived. And did I get it right that you just flew in a few days ago? Right. I flew in from California, San Francisco Bay Area, to join the Thawra for as long as I could take off from work. Oh, so you came just to participate in this moment. Right. And you're going back. I leave tomorrow. So in this, this tiny window, which was, I'm guessing, a few days only, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in less than a week. Yeah. Did you, did you feel that this is a moment that will persist after you go back home to California, that you're, that you, do you feel optimistic that even though it's now we're entering the fourth week, right. that the momentum will persist and that you're in California and you're going to witness positive change from abroad, or are you concerned that this might be taking too long? I would say that uh, to, to bring down a system that has been going on for decades, it's not going to happen overnight. Mm. But I do think that something shifted that you cannot unshift, and that's to wake up. Yeah. Like when you wake up and you see the dysfunction in yourself, yeah. you cannot unsee it or you see the patterns. Right. And I see. I would say that we are right now in the phase of like, holy shit. <laughs> so it's going to take some time yeah. for us to build new 
pathways, new patterns, new ways of doing things. I, I'm very optimistic because I do believe that things shift first on a, on a, I would say like more consciousness level, okay, yeah. and it takes time for it to be implemented in the day to day. But let me just get a step further into this. When we're referencing something like the Berlin Wall, right? That, I mean. The psychological barrier fell, I think, the first night where right. people started crossing the wall and, and going right. from west to east, east to west. Within months, Berlin was united. Within a year or two, Germany was already being, it was on its way to reunification. Right. Is there any hesitation that unless the momentum continues at this level, that we will see potentially a psychological so almost like a leaning back to our comfort zone where you have in a way it's it's the history of Lebanon where you have communities that kind of sort of go back to their communal tendencies right. the ele the leaders that we continue electing yeah. despite maybe knowing better will be re-elected elections I think are in two years municipal elections are coming around that will not be able to properly change the way Lebanon is governed unless the momentum stays at a high pitch? I, I, I trust in the organicity of the momentum. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that the reason why this is different is mm -hmm. because it's it's community based and if there is no leadership and there is no right. agenda. Right. So I am um, like Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a um, he's a monk from Vietnam and like a spiritual I love him, leader. I'm, gl I'm glad we're doing this because you're the first person in the dozens of interviews I've given that references someone as interesting as this. Yeah. Say his name again. Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh. He wrote okay. like about 70 books. Um, he's he, he was nominated for a Nobel Prize. So Thich Nhat Hanh said that the future is leaderless, that mm. the future is communities leading themselves. Mm. It's mm. finding the own leader in each and one of us. And that's a positive thing that now on the streets you don't see a visible Absolutely. name or, or a group of people. Right, like we're moving, I think, on a collective global level, the, the system of power that is triangular is falling mm. into a circular. So when we're in circle, we're all standing on the same level. Yeah. But we're in triangle, there is first people on top, and the second thing, there's less people on top. Right. And, and let me ask you, just in terms of political evolution, mm -hmm. Is it a good thing long term that this remains leaderless, or would you want to see eventually names emerge where you can sort of that this can translate potentially into not necessarily a political party, right, right, but that there is a there is an organization that allows it to enter the political framework. Um, it, or would you rather just see it like this for the time being? I think that let's see where it goes. I think mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I've been very very. Even like my system is shocked to see how people are self-organizing. Your system, <laughs> meaning yourself. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> how, is this even possible? It yeah, feels yeah. very surreal. The system makes us believe that it's impossible that we can break it. And what I'm seeing is people are, like at least the young new generation seems to have that possibility that no, things can change. <laughs> Yeah. So our enemy is not Israel or an outsider. Our enemy is the story that things cannot change. Interesting. Interesting. So this is almost like a self-reflection moment where people are looking inside yeah. for answers as opposed to anywhere else. Right. Okay. It's like, it's, it's again that victimization that, oh, it's always someone else's fault. So what do you do? You lose your power. Yeah. But people are like, no, shit, I have power. I can go right now and shut down... Um, like the ministry oh really like we can go 20 people we don't need anyone to tell us yeah. we can go now this is embarrassing to ask you this question but it's relevant for this topic how old are you? <laughs> I'm 34 34 so you're not you're not much younger than me we're more or less in the same generation that we know a time where there was no social media right and we know a time where there was no whatsapp right. or, or twitter do you think and I think 34 is old enough to actually have some distance that technology has created this for us? I don't say, I would say it, it, it created, I think it accelerated change. Accelerated? Change. Okay. And, and it's also interesting because technology has had a lot of negative impact, but, it, but seeing how technology is being used during uprising and revolutions mm -hmm. uh, has been also very powerful. Because I know that you've written poetry yourself about things related to what's happening and people can now view it online they yeah. don't have to wait for your book to be published right they can simply just click 
right. and it's instantaneous. Yeah. Is that part of it that is simply accelerating people's emotions and responses to a degree that maybe we expect more now from everything? Uh, again, we're going back from triangle to circle. Like right now, anyone can share media. Right. right? You yeah. don't need one agency to tell you what to do. Exactly. It's not trickling down. It's trickling yeah. across. And we can even potentially communicate with the leadership because we just send a tweet. And even though they may not see it, their team may see it. Yeah. So it's almost like a... One, two. Yeah, it's a leveling of the playing field. Yeah. Do you, do you think art... And in your case, let's say poetry or or, uh, or even writing mm. in general, does it play a role in this revolution? Because I and I'm I'm embarrassed to say this a bit, but Gibran Basile's uh, poem. I don't know if we can call it poetry, but I think it's a form of poetry. It's a form of expression. Is that? I mean, I think we'll look back on that. We will remember this for the rest of Lebanese history. That. that <laughs> that's the most beautiful, elegant thing it's been called. Thank you. I mean, I don't know what to call it. Cause it's, what would you call it? No, I think it is like a shabby poetry. It is shabby poetry, yeah. Do you think that is playing a central role in the, in the what you described, this circular feeling? That yeah. We're all singing this song together. And we don't know who's who. It could no. be... And you know what? I've noticed something. The older generation is not as sensitive to swearing because the youth is doing it and, and they're taking the momentum is there yeah. so people that should be embarrassed are not embarrassed yeah. do, do you see art as central to what we're what, what's happening right now I mean the, the, the revolution ha- have and will always be led by artists and activists mm. so we're bringing back the artists and the activists because they're the dreamers mm. right they're the ones who uh, probably don't care about money as much so yeah and I also love that uh, people are getting are tapping into their creativity and the, I mean that's how you create a new country yeah. it's like I think it's a metaphor for someone to be now right now who's been sitting at home say with jobless or raining using yeah. and someone doing zajal on the street uh, and someone creating a new um, like chant and, yeah. and someone singing and someone painting and doing street art like I think people are are tapping into their creativity and it's that same source that will create the new country that we want and you did you see a role for yourself when you flew back to Lebanon that you wanted to be a part of this yourself that you want people that you want to remember that you contributed individually to this moment is that what brought you back I think it, yeah I was I, I was sitting at home in San Francisco I remember and I was like so upset one night and I was like I'm doing zero contribution to my country right now by sitting here and I remember going into therapy the next day he helped me see that um, that there was nowhere else I should be right now but in my country and see what, how I can contribute not by me deciding again by being there and everything happening organically and honestly like I still feel like I'm not doing much I still want to do more and I don't yeah it's, 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 it's not easy like I can I feel the pain of a lot of the expats right now who are because I was with them to be like what, are you, what should I do I want to do something you mean the expats meaning the diaspora yeah yeah. now I'm, I'm curious because I've been here the whole time yeah are they in celebratory mode the way we are <gasps> that's all they're talking about and even I mean we see images right and mostly from Paris because yeah. there's a huge population there but in a place like San Francisco, which doesn't have a big Lebanese Wait, population. we were 200 people at the... At 200. The, but yes. were, but did, it, did it feel like... Um, was the... I don't want to sound... The spirit? Certain, yes. Did you... Because now you've seen both. I think the spirit outside is more positive. Interesting. Because okay. they're not... I think here there is still... The, there, you, sometimes you see the visions and people hating on each other. Yeah. But outside, I think we have more hanin for and, the watan. And, right. and we're like... We love it. Like, it's yeah. more idealistic than on the ground. And does, I guess distance plays a role because you don't necessarily need to see the bad right, in San Francisco. Right, right, right. Um, I, I'm, we only met now, yeah. which is good because uh, I, I like this. We don't know anything about each other other mm-hmm. than the superficial. Right. Um, I do know that you've written poetry and you have a book right. that's available for purchase. Yeah. And it's I'd... called Child of the Moon. Yeah. So I'm going to link it to the podcast. You wrote a poem recently. Right. And you and you shared it online. Yeah. So I'm going to link it, but do you mind maybe reading it? Okay. okay. 
So this is Lebanon. I'm coming home by Jessica Sama. Lebanon, I'm coming home. A love letter from an immigrant to her country. Habibi Lebanon, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that time I left you with a ghassa in my heart, tears in my eyes, and holes in my pocket. I promised you to return the next year and the year after and the one after, but I lied. I got an apartment abroad, I got a job, I got a partner, I got an accent. I am sorry for all those times I called your seam lawase and your hawa polluted. I watched the kisarat rape your valleys and instead of doing something I vowed to never come back to you. I'm sorry for all the times I called your residence Rajaiye for littering the roads, for voting for thieves and criminals over and over. What did I do to help them, to help you, to help me, but take the next plane and to forget you? You see, I tried to forget you, but I failed. Ya Habib, El Beno love compares to a first love and you are and will always be mine. I'm sorry I never told you how much I loved you. I'm sorry I did not allow me to face the heartbreak of leaving you. For I did not want to break mama's heart. I can hear mama in every WhatsApp voice note. I can hear her tone voice asking me to come home, knowing that they took everything from our home, even our dignity. No, I am not better off in foreign civilized lands. Just because I have a roof above my head, a job in Rattab, Shahid in America, I'm still a lonely island in a sea of materialism. No one loves like your people. No one jokes like your people. No one gives like your people. And no one is as resilient as your people. Although I have said I am over you, I still go to bed alone. I still long for your Jabal breeze, for the smell of the manouche, for my teta's smile, for my mother's laugh for your chaotic energy, for the dancing till sunrise. So today, I put all my sorrow away, leave this foreign place and fly away. Today I'm coming home with a heart ready to serve, because there is nowhere else I would rather be but sweeping your streets, chanting your name, kissing your cedar trees, hugging your people. There has never been a home like you. There has never been a home but you. My favorite prose is when you write in another language that the audience doesn't need to know because they understand regardless. Right. And I sense from this poem, not only has been written, not only was it written recently because it's about your departure mm. from America back home, but it's also a there's an internal, almost an internal pain there that it maybe uh, it's not so much. It's not just about Lebanon, it's about yourself. Right. Are you healing yourself to a degree by participating in this revolution? Um, whatever is in me is in my country, or whatever is in my country is in me. So in my process of healing from my own PTSD and trauma from my childhood, which I write a lot about, I've encountered the collective pain of Lebanon. Um, and, you, you know, when the war is over, the war is still in us sometimes. And I had a war in me, so seeing my, my country revolt against the system has empowered me personally to revolve against my own shame, my own self-blame, my own self-hate. Is that part of the reason you left? I left because I wanted to have a good job, to have good studies, like almost like a lot of the Lebanese who can afford. I, I, I happened to get a full scholarship to Stanford, so I couldn't say no. I've never heard of it. Where is Stanford? It's <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. So you left mostly for to pursue a, a dream that may not have been available here. Right, and, and freedoms. Like, I can be, like, as a woman, I have more freedoms in the West. And I got that from reading, and I saw your blog on Medium, that there is a, a yearning, a, a maybe a plea, to bring down uh, something uniquely Lebanese, which is, and I don't want to speak on your behalf, but uh, you've, that woman's empowerment is not where it needs to be in this country. At all. And I'm guessing, I'm guessing, to 
San Francisco, the standards are different, but I'm sure there's issues there right, too. Right, absolutely. What do you see emerging from this protest today in terms of women's involvement, not just in politics, not just in society in general, but, but just in, in, in equating that do you sense because women have been so central to what has happened and I mean I guess where you're protesting we saw Nahar has a giant new national anthem and they've made it very clear what the what the difference is right women do you feel that beyond the economic problems yeah. beyond corruption beyond the governing model that this is a unique opportunity for women to now play a not just a central but a a key role in the future of this country? Women have been playing a key role. That's the thing. that I think that the Lebanese women have not been acknowledged. Mm. They are not helping the revolution. They are not the centerpiece. They are the revolution. Interesting. Women are the revolution. Yeah. Women are the future. Um, and and women are oppressed in Lebanon. Although sometimes we don't even know it. But when I went to the U.S., I realized, oh my God, so many things I took for granted were oppression. Can you give me an example of that? Like, like how I'm judged, um, like for the way I dress and being called a whore just because on the street, just because I'm wearing a skirt that's not too short. Where I can, I usually take it for granted. Now I realize this is aggression. I have to look a certain way. We have to, um, you know, even in our sexuality is not liberated. Mm. You know, uh, even like the LGBTQ rights in Lebanon are non-existent. So it's not only women. I would say also it's minority groups. Um, but these minority groups are like if we go down right now it's the people who are actually leading the revolution not the people on stage forget that what do you mean by stage they go on stage and talk oh these the people on the, the street who are oh, actually yes, organizing yeah, and yeah, leading yeah, yeah. a lot of them are women and LGBTQ community yeah. and you sense that that this time around they, they are central to what's happening I mean because I yeah and I, mean, I say this I mean, I, my knowledge of it, I'm saying it as somebody who's not so in tune right. with uh, with what you're what you're describing. Do you feel that this is a breakthrough moment for for dis disenfranchised minorities? Right. The system is patriarchal. Like all these men in suits are, they're men. They've been ruling the country. Now let me. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be devil's advocate here. I just want to ask you a broader question. The Minister of Interior has been celebrated left and right, right. for being the first female Minister of Interior, mm. I think, for the region. And not just for Lebanon, but for the Middle East. Is that to you more just cosmetic, that it's not a, yeah. it's not a real breakthrough? Token. You know, token. you need a token. Right. No. I mean, the, that's what's beautiful. The dismantling of the patriarchy is going to lead to a new system that doesn't. that's not hierarchical. So... I'm, what does that system look like, though? I don't know. That's the beauty, is that mm. we're mm. all, like, we've seen what's happening with the climate crisis, what's happening with slavery and all, and we understand, I think, on a collective basis that whatever systems we live in are collapsing. Interesting. Right? So but there is a lot of unknown, but a part of it is instead of fear, yeah. I'm having curiosity. Right. Because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, and that's the beauty. Yeah. It's like we don't know where we're going towards, but we know that we don't want what we've been into. Right. What are tangible results for you? Now that you've seen so many people demanding change, and you've seen a crack in the system, you've seen people on the streets demanding dignity, what would you like to see as a real fundamental change the next time you visit? I would like to... Like, that's my dream, but I would like to see um, some of these people in prison. Okay, now that goes into something else, which is <laughs> accountability. You would like to see people punished for their crimes. Yeah, the, the people who stole money. Yeah, I think that is, a, that is a unique moment in Lebanon where that's even being discussed openly. Right. And that's something we take for granted when we leave. I'm guessing you feel the same way when it's almost assumed that corrupt people go they they are punished for their crimes here no it's the opposite right. they're elevated so you, you would like to see corruption tackled and it's in its most uh, in its concrete most I want concrete yes I want like who is the corrupt person okay right. yalla let's put him in jail like where is he right right I mean who is he were you in Martyrs Square two days ago when they had the uh, the anti-corruption show 
the yeah, the, the new TV. Yeah, Did, were you there? We for were that there, moment? yeah. yeah. Oh, you were. Yeah. Is, 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 is that something, is that a stepping stone in the direction it's that you're huge. talking about? I mean, even mm. people like naming names, even like I think, I don't know, you know, even though it might not change immediately, I think that change is coming. It might take a little longer. Yeah, yeah. But this, the era of the thieves is over. I think that's a nice title for a upcoming, uh, maybe a sequel to the story. <laughs> so your book, Child of the Moon, is available at Liberi Antoine for Lebanese who want to buy it. Mm -hmm. And for a international audience, I'm guessing Amazon and uh, any and, other... And Barnes and & Noble. Barnes & Noble. Amazon UK, US, Excellent. anywhere in Europe. Well, I think you are definitely finding light in collective darkness. A lot of us are doing the same thing yeah. for the moment. So, recommended book. Thank you, Jessica. Shukran. Thank you. Daily episodes as the uprising continues. Please consider a donation through the Patreon link in the details box. And if you want to stay updated, subscribe to your preferred podcast platform or find us on our YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. Music